Uh, one more note, we're going to have our communion Sunday next Sunday, and of course we'll have the fellowship dinner following it. And if you are going to bring a dish, you need to put it, not the dish, but put your name. <laughs> I would rather you put the dish, but you can put your name on the list. Pardon? Oh yeah, that'd be great. Uh, do we have any um, theme or just whatever you have? or Fourth of July. So bring your Fourth of July dish. Oh, we are. Oh, okay. Sides and salads and desserts. And I might add a lot of sides and salads. <laughs> so, anyhow, uh, that's, and also you may have noticed in the bulletin that if you've signed up for the uh, young people's, the, uh, what is that called, Child Evangelistic Ministries, uh, the Good News Club, if you signed up for that, we have dis decided on the date of July the 19th is when we are going to have the trainer here. It's going to be from 9 in the, nine in the morning. That's a Saturday. And it'll be from 9 in the morning till 3 that afternoon. And we'll have food here, so um, you don't have to worry about going somewhere. We'll, we'll have that covered. So that's July the 19th on a Saturday. Okay, let's prepare ourselves in our usual fashion. We'll have a few moments of silent prayer. The opportunity to name privately to God the Father any unconfessed sins that ensures the filling of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful who you are and that not only are you mindful of us, that you are aware of us. Indeed, you love us with a love that we can't even comprehend. We thank you for this time that we have to assemble ourselves together. We're in the last phase of the star series and we are all in awe of what you have created. So we pray that you will help us to focus and concentrate as we go over the last constellation today, for we pray it in Christ's name, amen. Okay, I've been waiting for this one. Uh, George, you might as well kill the lights there if you don't mind. We're on the last constellation in the zodiac, and here it is. It's Leo the Lion. Leo the lion. Here's the ecliptic, which is also known as the, uh, as the zodiac. Well, new batteries, I guess. I have a backup. Here's the ecliptic right here. He falls on here. And this is Leo. Now, there are always three deacons or associate constellations that accompany the main constellation which it falls on this invisible arc across the sky it goes about like this is where it's located if we were outside it's where all the planets it's where the sun the moon everything uh in that sense goes and this is the 12th one which is leo and the three associate ones we have hydra here the snake a uh, hydra is a huge constellation uh, of course it's not massive in bulk but it's it spans uh it, it has been condensed here so you can see it uh, on this one uh, slide. But if we actually made it the size that it is, we would have to really expand it way uh, in both directions because it goes over the constellation of Cancer, Leo, and Virgo. It is actually spread out that far over those three constellations. So we have Hydra the snake, we have Crater the cup, and Carvus is the bird. Actually, we'll see that that's a raven. I guess some people might call it a crow. I mean, I'm not a, what do you call a, a bird ologer? <laughs> what, what, what do they call those guys? A, a, a what? Hardy call? Horn. Hornicologist. <laughs> bird eyes. A bird watcher. Okay. Well, I'm sorry I asked at this point. 
I don't know what, why they would be called hornologists. What? Oh, orn. Orn, okay. I, can't, I never saw a bird with horns, so that, that didn't make sense. Okay, so the <laughs> these are the three that associate with Leo the lion. Now, I put this on right before we began, this next one. This one, Oop, not that one. This one. And what this does is it shows the zodiac, which is this arc that goes all the way around the sky. Here is the sun. And of course, here's the earth. And it takes one year to go around the sun. And as the earth travels in its arc, from our perspective, it, all these different constellations come into view. There are 12 of them. They take up 30 degrees of that arc. And so that makes 360 degrees. And we start here with Virgo. That's the one we started with, and it is the appropriate one to go to if you are going to be discussing God's message in the stars. So you have Virgo, Libra, Scorpio, Sagittarius, Capricorn, Aquarius, Pisces, Aries, Taurus, Gemini, Cancer, and now here we are at Leo. And these are actually divided into three acts. It's like it's a play that, uh, that consists of three acts. And uh, I'll go into that more um, next time. I don't think that I'm, I'm almost certain, I am certain, that we won't get through with Leo today. I mean, Leo and its associate um, constellations. So I just, for those who may have not uh, been here before or just been here maybe once or twice during this, this is where we've gone through all this way, and now we are at Leo. Now, uh, God's message in the star started with Virgo, the virgin, and ends with Leo, the lion. The zodiac has come fu full circle, and the tail of the lion is touching the head of the virgin. I, don't, I, don't, I wish you could see it as clear as it is on my uh, co uh, computer. Yeah, that helps. Thank you. Here's the virgin right here, Virgo. Here is Leo. And in this representation, you see the head of the virgin is right here and the tail of Leo is right over her head there. So they nearly connect. Now, some of you have, have uh, when you, we went over this Virgo to begin with, I showed a PowerPoint that I'm about to show you again, but it's relevant here. And that is the, of the great sphinx in Egypt. And the great sphinx of Egypt has the head of a woman and the body of a lion. And I don't know if anyone can say with 100% certainty what that depicts. However, I think it's reasonable. I would like to even say probable, but I don't know if I can go that far. But it's very reasonable that is depicting the beginning and the ending of God's message in the stars. Now here is, starts with Virgo, that's Virgo there, ends with Leo there. Now here's the Sphinx, has the head of a woman and the, um, and the body of a lion. See, here's the lion's tail here. Have, have any of you ever been to the Sphinx and seen it? Okay, we don't have a bunch of world travelers here. Uh, <laughs> I haven't seen it. But to give you an idea of how big it is, see that right there? That's a man standing up right here, see? So that gives you uh, kind of an idea how awesome this is. This isn't something that you would build in your backyard. This is, this is a massive thing. And you have the pyramid. I don't know which one it is, but there's a pyramid there behind it. So I think it's interesting to speculate at least that it's very possible that that's what they had in mind because some people think of the people who lived back in the day when they whoever it was made the sphinx uh, were cave dwellers and ignorant listen they were they knew a lot more about the heavens than most people do today and so um we've come a full full circle Lord Jesus Christ is the Lion of Judah. And he will return to earth one day. 
and he will defeat all the enemies and he will reclaim the title deed to earth that was usurped by Satan who was the interloper and he will set up his millennial kingdom. So this is the good news. We know that Jesus Christ is actually coming back two more times, isn't he? He's coming back for us, which is his bride. We're not the bride yet, but we will be when he comes to gather us. And we call that the rapture, and we don't know when that is going to take place. But when we have been gathered to him, and we are... Actually, what we'll be doing at that point is we'll be being uh, reviewed at the judgment seat of Christ to see who is going to get rewards and decorations and so forth and who will not. But while that's going on, there's going to be a great calamity on earth, the tribulation. At the end of that seven-year period, Jesus Christ is coming back again. Now, he doesn't touch earth when he returns to get us, if we're still around. Uh, but he does at the second advent. And that's what we have been uh, looking at. Here's something I think that's interesting. Remember we were just looking at the Big Dipper here? The Big Dipper? Actually, uh, it's not a dipper. It, the words is, are not a, are, is not the Big Dipper. It's the, it's the, uh, the redeemed assembled in, a, in an enclosure. However, if you take the Big Dipper and these two stars at the end of the Dipper here are called pointing stars. Because if you see, the, most people can see the Big Dipper. How many of you have seen the Big Dipper and know where it is? Well, y'all are, see, y'all are maybe amateur astrologers. Uh, if you take these two stars and line them up, it points essentially to Leo the Lion. So if you want to know where Leo the Lion is, you just can find the pointer stars and go and find it. Leo, the lion, is one of the constellations that looks more like what it depicts than most. Something like uh, Cancer was just uh, three or four stars that didn't have any real, um, real connection to what it depicted. But Leo does. I can just see a lion here. You can't see this, this very, very well, this lion. But it looks like this is the head. This, sometimes this is called the great, great question mark. Do you see that it looks like a question mark? But this looks like his, the, his chest coming down and his head and his mane coming up there. Here's what it looks like with a couple of star names in there. So that's a, Oh, by the way, if you have these pointer stars we were just looking at, when you see the Big Dipper, if you go this direction, you'll see Leo. And if you go this direction where they're pointing to, what are you going to find? Polaris, right, the North Star. So if you're ever lost and you're out at night, you can see, uh, if it's not cloudy and you see the stars, you can find the Big Dipper. These two point to the North Star and you'll know what direction to go. Okay. Uh, so here's uh, Leo the lion, what he looks like. Uh, it looks like a, a lion laying at rest. Now here's to put it in perspective of what we're seeing. Now that, that might make you want to cross your eyes. But it's, it's a, a, a sphere, it's a plane to show you where these constellations are in reference to each other. And so here we have, you may remember what that one is? That's Cancer. It's, here's, here's Leo, the lion, the one that we're looking at now. This is Virgo, the virgin. See, the, the head of the virgin would be right along in here, and here's the tail of the lion. Uh, gold stars, anybody remembers what this one is? I don't get, I, when I say gold stars, I'm pretty sure you're not going to get it. <laughs> I'm very stingy with my gold stars. Um, this is Coma, C-O-M-A. Remember, that's the virgin who is sitting and she's holding the child. That's part, uh, that's a... a constellation uh, uh, associate of Virgo now here is Hydra this is that snake that I was talking about and here is crater and here is Corvus so that and the ecliptic you see would be going right through these see within about eight degrees of the ecliptic are the are the main uh, main players as far as the constellations are concerned. I just got this one because I liked it. 
that's, that's Leo the lion, and it shows kind of uh, what, what he would look like. Okay, uh, <clears throat> now I said that Jesus Christ is coming again. And he's going to reclaim the title deed to the earth in, uh, in Revelation uh, uh, chapter, um, I think it's chapter 6, where he's pulling the seals off of the scroll. Uh, this is the title deed to earth, essentially, and Jesus Christ is coming back to reclaim it. If you hit the lights and have them come back on, George, I'd like everyone to turn to Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5. No, that's Re that was Revelation 6 that I was mentioning just, I mean, excuse me, uh, Revelation 5 instead of 6 because we have it right here. Revelation chapter 5, verse 1. Turn to it also. Re Revelation chapter 5, verse 1. And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a book written inside and on the back sealed with seven seals. Uh, this is referring to um, that scroll that I was talking about. It says a book, but when this was written, they didn't have books. They had scrolls. Verse 2. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who's worthy to open the book and to break the seals? Now, when it's talking about I, who is it talking about? It's ta well, no, it's talking about John. The Apostle John who wrote this. And I, John, saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to break the seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the book or to look inside of it. Now why is that? Because Jesus Christ is the only one that is capable and able to break the seals. Verse 5. And one of the elders said to me, Stop weeping, behold, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has... root of David has overcome so that so to open the book and its seven seals. So you have uh, John here that was uh, in a dither. And the reason is because if no one could break the seals and open the scroll, then essentially Satan would continue to have dominion over the earth. You understand? That's why uh, John was uh, frightened about that. Pardon? Verse uh, did I skip verse 4? Thank you, Danny. I have uh, I'm get, uh, my notes here. I'm having a problem with them, so I'm going back and forth, and that's why I uh, skipped that. Okay, number 4. And I began to weep greatly because no one was found worthy to open the book or to look into it. Now, that's why John was weeping, is because if someone had to open the scroll and break the seals to get the deed back, which uh, Satan had... Um, had usurped from, uh, in other words, when Adam in the garden originally had, um, wow, Adam in the garden originally had dominion over the earth, and what happened? He lost it when he fell, and Satan came in and usurped that dominion, and this is what uh, this is talking about. Now, Again, the constellation uh, of Leo, we see the symbolism of Christ triumphant, crushing the head of Satan, or the snake. Let's go back here and look at that. See it? Right 
right here. Now what is that, what is that symbolic of? What verse have we gone over and over in this study? Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Where Christ is going to crush the head of the serpent, which in this, of course, we're talking about uh, Satan. Now, this isn't the first time this has happened. Throughout this study, we have seen superheroes who have destroyed the enemy. And what was it each time? Their foot is on the head of the enemy. We saw it in Scorpio. Remember, in Scorpio, we had Ophiuchus, the mighty man who crushed the head of the uh, Scorpio the scorpion. Remember that one? We saw it in Hercules with his foot on the head of Draco, the ter terrible dragon. We saw it again in Orion with the great hunter and his foot on the head of Lepus, the snake. Remember they show it, Lepus, the rabbit. Please. And now we see it again in Leo with his foot at the head of Hydra. So the previous sign, Cancer, pictured the final rest and homecoming of the redeemed, and Leo completes the story by showing the final end of the enemy, the enemy crushed. The Hebrews called this sign Ariah, R-I-A-R-I-E-H, which is one of the six words in Hebrew meaning lion. There's six words in Hebrew that means lion, and A-R-I-E-H is the one word that refers to a, hunting, uh, to a lion hunting down its prey. So we're not talking about a pussycat here. We're talking about a ferocious beast. Lions are incredibly fierce and powerful. Do you know that a lion can run up to 50 miles an hour and it sustain that for two minutes? Do you know that lions weigh anywhere from 330 pounds to 550 pounds? How would you like something 500 pounds hit you going 50 miles an hour with claws and teeth? Mighty creature. In Nahum chapter 2, verse 12, it says, The lion tore enough for his cubs, killed enough for the lioness, and filled his lair with prey and his dens with torn flesh. Lions don't eat grass. They eat meat. They're meat eaters. They are carnivores. Now this lion is showing actually what uh, killed enough for his lioness. He was taking care of his, well, I guess, yeah, well, no, I wouldn't think about pride. I was thinking about what is the, I was going to say his wife, but since lions don't marry, I guess that would be, uh, what, uh, nat what do they call them now for the uh, union, a natural union? Or <laughs> Never mind, I'm forgot. I'm sorry I went there, it just came in my mind, and I was trying to make a clever remark about the lion's wife, but I regret it. And he filled his lair with prey and his dens with torn flesh. Daniel chapter 6 verse 24. I like this one as well. And the king gave the command and brought those men who had accused Daniel. Now remember Daniel was conspired against by jealous rulers in the land. And they said, O king, make a rule that for a certain amount of time, everyone has to pray to you. And, of course, his arrogance, he kind of liked that idea. And so he made the decree. And sure enough, Daniel, not only did he not stop praying, he prayed with his windows open. And, of course, they got him, threw him in the lion's den. God protected him. And now, uh, and by the way, the king liked Daniel. But he had to throw him in there because he had to keep his word. And this is what happened afterwards. Those that were accused, they cast them into the den of lions, them, their children, and their wives. And the lions overpowered overpower them and broke all their bones in pieces before they ever came to the bottom of the den. 
In other words, the lions caught them in midair and had crushed their bones before they ever even hit the ground. That is a powerful beast. I, have you ever been on one of those little safari things and gone through and seen the lions? Anybody have done that? Is it, does your heart start kind of go pity pat when you see one of these beasts? I know mine would. Especially, I mean, I know you're in a car. But things can happen, can't they? So, <coughs> let's look at the, the names of the stars. I'm just going to go through this real fast, so just kind of. Okay, here is the heart of the lion right here, and it's called Regulus, R-E-G-U-L-L-U-S, and it's the heart of the lion. The star name means treading underfoot. Remember when we were in Joshua and the five kings that had conspired to go against Gibeon and because the Israelites made an oath to be on the uh, to take the Gideonites in and be part of them, they had to go and they made war against these kings. The battle went on and the kings were just put in a cave. They hid in a cave, so they said, okay, fine, just put a, a block, blockage in front of the cave, I don't know, rocks or whatever it was. And they went on, finished the battle, and they came back to the cave and they opened it up. And here's the five kings that were responsible for this whole mess. And Joshua ordered all five kings out of the cave, and he did something that was strange, but now it will make sense. He had all those five kings lay down prostrate on the ground, and he had his officers go and put their foot on the neck of these kings. Y'all remember that? That is total submission. That is what that was demonstrating. And, of course, it would give morale to the, uh, to the officers, but it's the same thing here that we see in the stars, that submission. This is what God is going to do to his great enemy that is depicted as a scorpion and a dragon and a snake and so forth. He's going to be utterly defeated, and that's what that means. Here we have al Jiba, which means, that's this star right here, exaltation. So there's going to be great exaltation when the Lion of Judah comes back to earth and takes care of business. Are you ready for someone to take care of business? Boy, I am. I'm of the mind, and I think you probably are as well, that there's no one other than Jesus Christ that can sort out this mess. And he will not hesitate. And that's why this is so significant. He's not coming back. We're, we're not seeing something here of a, a suit, you know, like suit like I'm wearing, which lawyers wear he's not coming back to negotiate he's coming back to take control and the power that he wields is going to be the power necessary to unleash and to unlock the dominion of satan so it can be destroyed here we have minkar al assad and it means the tearing of the lion minkar m-i-n-c-h-a-r-a-l a-S-A-D. And I don't know if I spell uh, Algeba. It's A-L-G-I-E-B-H-A. And here we have Soz Sozma. And it means shining forth. He will come in great splendor and it will be shining. Here we have Denebola, D-E-N, E-O-B-O-L-A. And it means the judge who comes. Do you find it amazing, the, the names of these stars? How it depicts exactly what the message and, and the stars uh, have to say. Now the lion has always been the symbol of the tribe of Judah. And when Jacob the patriarch was dying, he pronounced this blessing on Judah with these words. George, if you'll hit the lights and if y'all will turn to Genesis chapter 49. Genesis chapter 49. 
Genesis chapter 49, verse 8. Now again, this is Jacob who was pronouncing blessings on his sons. And when he got to Judah, one of his sons, this is what he said. Judah, your brother shall praise you. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's sons shall bow down to you. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, you have gone. You have gone up. He crouches, he lies down as a lion, and as a lion who, who dares arouse ra- him. So he's like a resting lion right now. Uh, when it says he crouches down like a lion, I see this on a very, 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 very miniature scale because we have two cats, and one of them name is Pistol. They're Pistol and Puffin, but Pistol is the male. And he looks like a tiger, you know, a regular cat with the stripes on him and everything. And I love to watch him when he sees something. And a Puffin is a city gal, and she couldn't, she's bored with the hunting thing because all she does is sit on the, you know, come to the deck and it's time to eat. That's, that's her deal. But P- uh, P- Pistol is out there, and he is in the grass, and he's hunting. And, of course, everything that he gets, he comes and sits right at the front door. Bloody pulps and things anyway but to see him when he's walking along all of a sudden he he just startled he goes like this and then his next thing is he gets down low he reminds me of a dog on a point you know he's there Uh, it's all business very serious and you don't distract him when he's when he's in that mode in fact once he has got his prey and he, he's even got little rabbits before and, you know, we want to have compassion and we run to get them. There's, you're not getting that away from him. Now, he's just, you know, just a small cat, well, a regular-sized cat, but he'll take that prey and run. So that, if, if that can get my attention and I'm really enjoying this performance, uh, just think if it would be if it was a cat that was 550 pounds. Wow. In Numbers chapter 24, verse 8. Turn there too as well. Numbers chapter 24, verse 8. Now this is, un- <laughs> this is showing you the overruling power of God. Because here we have Balaam who, is, who was hired to curse Israel. And so he's all ready and he's going to curse Israel. But when he goes to curse, what happens? He winds up blessing uh, Israel. Because that was God's will, that he would bless Israel. And here in Numbers chapter 24, verse 8 through 9, this is what we see. And this is what Balaam, who was hired to curse Israel, this is what he says. God brings him, and the him here is referring to Jacob or Israel, because uh, Jacob's name was changed to Israel. So it could be either one. God brings him, Jacob, out of Egypt. What is that talking about? They're talking about the Exodus. Brings him, Israel, out of Egypt. He is for him, that is, the Lord is for Jacob, like horns of the wild ox. Remember Taurus the bull? It was the wild ox. And remember the horns that didn't go out like this. They went way up, pointed like that. And you don't want to be anywhere around the end of those horns. That's where the danger is. And that's what this uh, Balaam is saying, that our Lord is like the horns of the wild ox. He's talking about to his enemies. He will devour the nations who, who are his adversaries and will crush their bones in pieces and shatter them with his arrows. Now look at verse 9. He crouches. He lies down as a lion and as a lion who dare rouse him. Blessed Now, when he's talking about laying down, he's not talking about laying down sleeping. He's talking about laying down on the ground because he's about to to pounce. And then look at this last part. Blessed is everyone who blesses you, and cursed is everyone who curses you. Does that sound familiar? Now, write this in your Bible at this point. 
This is Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, restated again here. Now, this is part of the, the covenant. Remember what God told what God told uh, Abraham there? I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curse you. That's in uh, Genesis chapter 12, verse 3. And now it is passed on to his son and restated here. In Isaiah chapter 42, verse 13, it says, The Lord shall go forth as a mighty man. He shall stir up jealousy like a man of war. Actually, that word jealousy should be, is better translated, zeal. The Lord shall go forth. Well, let's go to Isaiah 42. I want you to write something in here, in your Bibles, to make a note of this. Isaiah 42, 13. Isaiah 42, 13. The Lord shall go forth as a mighty man. He shall stir up in what should be here. Zeal like a man of war. He shall cry, yea, roar. Now I want you to circle or underline that word, roar. He shall prevail against his enemy. What do you think about when you hear the word roar? What do you think of? A lion, right? And I looked this up yesterday, and it says that a male lion's roar can be heard up to five miles away. So if he's not far from you, and he roars, I believe he will get your attention. And this is, this, see, this is great, great analogies. I mean, when you see that he will roar, and you're thinking about the lion and a lion's roar. I don't think I've ever heard a lion other than on TV uh, roar. I haven't been to zoo in probably, I don't know, 40 years maybe. And when I did go to the zoo, though, I can still remember 40 years away, they didn't have. They may have the, had the lions, but they did have the tigers. And tigers are bigger than lions. I don't know if you knew that or not. And this this lion. I mean, this tiger looked like he was about eight feet long. And he. I don't know. He must have weighed maybe seven hundred pounds or so. And I was just in awe. I just stood and I was just a bolt. Well, no, see, forty. Uh, whatever old old I was, I just stood in awe of this phenomenal creature. And I would like to have heard him roar as long as I knew those bars were good and tight. Now, switch gears a little bit here. And these are the last two verses I'm going to give you on uh, Leo the lion. You see, Satan is this consummate counterfeiter. He counterfeits everything. He's counterfeited God's message in the stars. And that's what, what people today uh, call astrology. And people think, well, I'm, I, they, they look in the... Well, they, they probably look online now. They used to look in the newspaper. And I think this newspaper still will have the signs of the Zodiac and say, oh, this is a good day to buy or this is a good day to stay at home or whatever it is. And people, so there are some people who go, they, they take so much stock in that that they would, you would say they are a religious follower of astrology because that's their religion. And that's the counterfeit. But we have the same thing with, in the Bible about the lion because the Bible depicts Satan as a lion also. Remember that? In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, it says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a, what? Roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Now, don't let anyone be disconcerted about that. Because we also have the verse that says, Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. So we have nothing to fear 
uh, about the lion. However, um, he, ha he does have great power. In Proverbs chapter 28, verse 15 through 16, says, like a roaring lion and a rushing bear is a wicked, wicked ruler over a poor people. A roaring lion and a rushing bear is a, is a ruler over a poor people. In other words, they have no mercy. And then it goes on to say in verse 16, a leader who is great, who is a great a oppressor, lacks understanding... But he who hates unjust gain will prolong his days. So here we have unjust rulers that are compared to a roaring lion and a rushing bear and say that they lack understanding because they use their power uh, not wisely. They, they, do not, they are not ministers of God for good, which is what Romans chapter 13 calls them. But they are actually servants of Satan for evil. That's what that's depicting. Okay, we don't have much time left, but we have time to go to the next. Oh, I forgot I had these pictures of a lion. You like that? That's a lion right there. Boy, he's, you can't see all of his body. Let me let's see if I turn this off if that will help. Does that help? A little bit? Okay. Uh, and here's another one. That's the, the, the lion and the lamb. <laughs> now, I don't know how they got this picture because I thought that wasn't going to happen until the millennium. Because today, the lamb would be lunch. You have the lion, the lamb, and lunch. But anyway, that's uh, just don't you think that lions are majestic creatures? I mean, they're called the king of the jungle, and rightly so. Okay, now we go to Hydra, the, and this is, the, again, a serpent. And Hydra means, the word Hydra means the abhorred. A-B-H-O-R-E-D. And, and it depicts the evil one who deceived Eve in the Garden of Eden. Now, you can dislike someone, and that's one thing. You can hate someone, and that's even more intense. But when you abhor someone, I don't know where, a, a word more that, that's stronger than that for deploring someone to just to abhor. And so, by the way, you know, I abhor snakes. I don't just not like them. I don't just hate them. I abhor them. And I think most people, maybe they don't abhor them, but th I don't think most people like them. But there are some people that have snakes for pets. There's some lady in Houston that they just hauled out of, I don't know, whole house full of snakes. And I'm thinking, is that normal? I mean, when I... A snake is the only critter on the road that I will swerve out of my way to hit, not to miss. The rest of them I will, I will try to, if I can, I'll try to miss them. But I, if the Lord just said, there is no snakes, they're, boop, they're gone. I think, thank you, Lord. I don't like snakes. I think you get the point. <laughs> How many is on board with me? All right. We got some smart people going. But here in this constellation, the conquering lion, the conquering lion pounces, on it, pounces on it, bringing the reign of sin and death to an end because that's what it's all about. Hydra is the largest constellation, I told you earlier, stretching below the constellations of Cancer, Leo, and Virgo. It has but one bright star. You see it right here. Alphard, A-P-H-A-R-D. That's the only really uh, bright star in it. And <clears throat> Alphard means the excluded are put out of the way. It's a, and so Satan is excluded from heaven. 
he has been put out of the way. And, boy, this is a, a hit the lights for me, if you will, George. Um, turn to Revelation chapter 12, verse 7. Because I'm, I'm picking up on this thought being excluded or put out of the way. And in Revelation chapter 12, verse 7 through 9, did I show you, did, did I show you this, this one? This is just a brighter picture of what uh, Hydra looks like. And here it, looks, here it is uh, depicting the, the stars. It, it's hard to find because it just stretches out in a long uh, area. Now, I'm picking up on this idea of excluded or put out of the way because we know that Satan was the anointed cherub that covered and he, when he fell, when he sinned against God, he was kicked out of heaven. In fact, there are three falls that, that can be found in the Bible where uh, Satan was excluded or put out of the way. I like, instead of saying put out of the way, I like kicked to the curb or kicked out of heaven. Three falls. And what we see in Revelation chapter 12, verse 7 through 9, is the second time that he fell. The second fall. And I won't have... I'll just give you this verse, and then I'm going to show you a PowerPoint that we'll go over next time that shows the three falls of Satan. But this is the second fall, and uh, I wanted you to see that one particularly. Revelation chapter 12, verse 7. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail, nor was there a place found for them in heaven any longer. What is that talking about? They're going to be kicked out. So the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world, and he was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast with him. Now, when this is going to take place, is in the middle of the tribulation, is he go he's going to be kicked out of heaven, and it's the beginning of the eschatology that is called the time of Satan's desperation. Okay, George, if you'll knock off the lights. I don't have time to go into this to any great detail, but this is what I'm talking about. And this has to do with the name Alphard, the, the bright star and the serpent that is under the paw of the lion, which is Leo. This is just showing the earth's different phases here, and we have three falls here. And first of all, we have the earth. This is in Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And this was, he created it out of nothing, and it was completed, it was created complete, and it was perfect. It wasn't a blob that he had to work on. God doesn't have to create that way. He created it, boom, in a moment of time. By the way, who specifically created it? Jesus Christ. We know that from Colossians. So Jesus Christ created it out of nothing. That's Genesis 1.1. In Genesis 1.2, we have, we, have, we have chaos. And the earth, your Bible says, um, was without form and void, which is tohu wa bohu in the Hebrew. But that word, I, many would say, is not and the earth was, but the earth became without form and void. You see the difference. And I th the, the Bible um, will actually sub substantiates that. And so the earth became without form and void. Why is that? What happened there? Well, here before the earth was created, the Lucifer and the angels were created. And in Isaiah 14, in verse 13, this is where you have the f you've heard of the five I wills of Satan. And these five I wills, he said he would ascend to the north and he would do all these things. And he essentially he says, I will be God. He wanted to take God's place. This is in Isaiah chapter 14 and Ezekiel chapter 28. This is verse 15. 
you have another commentary in the Bible about s Satan's original fall because he was the greatest crea creature that came from the hand of God. But Satan had something that we have that is very significant. What is that? Volition or free will. And he used that free will to uh, go against God. And when he did, we know there was a trial. And during that trial, we also know that Satan was found guilty. In, in uh, Matthew 25, 41, it talks about uh, the lake of fire that was created for Satan and his angels, but they weren't tossed into the lake of fire then. They w it would have been, God would have been justified in doing it. But no doubt Satan protested that uh, he was found guilty, and he was guilty. He drew one-third of the angels with him, by the way. So God created man, a lesser creature, but still he had volition as well to demonstrate that just because God creates a creature with volition doesn't mean that God is responsible for how they use that volition. Satan was responsible for how he used his free will. You and I are the same. We're responsible for how we use our free will. And every time a person accepts the gospel uses their volition to accept the grace of God. It's another nail in the coffin of Satan. That's what this is about. And he fell. Now, when Satan fell and he came to earth, here you have earth um, that I don't know what state it was before Satan fell and, and went to the earth, but we do know once he was there, it became without form and void. He made a mess of it somehow. And God said, okay, I'll just turn off the lights. And when he turned off the lights... This is what is described in Genesis 1, uh, chapter, uh, verse 2. And, uh, and it's talking about it became, uh, there, was, there was no light. When you don't have light, you don't have any heat. And there was an ice pack around earth. This is what you see here. And we don't know how long the ice pack lasted. But we, knew, we do know that there was a point in time that God decided, okay, I'll let Satan cool his heels long enough, pardon the pun. And he says, I'm going to... Uh, start the earth to rotate and there was a there was a, a heat um, there was darkness upon the face of the deep that's what uh, Genesis 1 2 says because God turned the lights out and the spirit hovered above the waters that was the Holy Spirit that came gave the heat that was needed necessary and then you have in verse 3 the restoration of planet earth and so from planet three on to the end of the chapter, you have God taking what uh, was a mess and creating it as how we know it today, or pretty, pretty close. We, of course, we had the flood later. All right, so now Satan, when the earth uh, was in chaos, he put ice around it and so forth. We do know at one point Satan was able to have access to heaven again and earth because Satan accuses believers and what do we have in Job chapter 1? What is God saying? He's talking to Satan. Did you notice my, my servant Job down here? And he's talking to, to, to God in heaven. So uh, Satan did, did or does have the right to, I don't know if it's at times or what the schedule is or anything like that, but we know he does have access to heaven and now he is in the atmosphere. There are demons and there are fallen angels who take up the residence in unbelievers and in the first heaven, which is the environment or the, the, uh, the clouds in the sky, this type of thing around the, what, what do they call that that's around the earth, the atmosphere? Um, that's where they reside now. So that's where, this was the first fall. Now they have access to heaven and they're up there. Uh, here's the earth. Now we go from the restoration to the earth all the way to the mid-tribulational point. Now, that's a long time. We're probably talking about maybe somewhere around 6,000 years. And so Satan is going to be able to be the power. The, in fact, the Bible calls him the prince of the power of the air. And so he's going to be able to reside in this sphere until we have been raptured. We're off of earth. The tribulation starts, and at the midpoint of the tribulation, he is kicked out again. Uh, this time he's kicked out of the uh, atmosphere there. And am I going too fast? Y'all staying with me? Okay. 
Um, <clears throat> and this is in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12, and Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 16. I'm, I'm already, I, I have probably two minutes left, so I can't go into these scriptures today. But next time, we'll start here, and I'll go into these scriptures, these scriptures, and they will explain this is going to happen at the midpoint of the tribulation. So that's the second fall. And this is going to be three and a half years from the midpoint to here. And at the end of that tribulational period, you have Jesus Christ returns at the second advent to set up his millennial kingdom. And Satan is tossed into the bottomless pit, the, the great abyss. And he's going to be there until this, this reign of Christ on earth, which lasts a thousand years, is going to expire. And at the end of that thousand years, he's going to be released. And when he is released, now remember, the millennium, Jesus Christ is going to be ruling planet Earth from Jerusalem. We will be there in our resurrection bodies. And you're going to have Old Testament believers who are going to be in their resurrection bodies. And there is going to be perfect environment. That's where you saw the lion laying down with the lamb. Animals are going to lose their ferocity. And I guess at that time, maybe lions will eat hay, grass. Uh, I guess they could live on that. I don't guess they'd really prefer it. But anyway, uh, everything's going to be perfect. And with a perfect environment, Christ literally ruling from Jerusalem on planet Earth, you're going to have millions, if not billions of people who are going to rebel against the Lord Jesus Christ. Can you believe that? And in Revelation uh, chapter 20, it talks about them being as the number of sand grain, like the sand of the sea is going to be how many that are going to side with Satan at the end of this millennium period. And Jesus Christ, by the way, that's called the Gog Revolution. There's also a, a Gog revolution in Ezekiel, but there's, this is a different one. At the end of time, Jesus Christ crushes the revolution and sends Satan to the lake of fire, Revelation chapter 20, verse 9 through 10. Here's a gra gra the Gog revolution is found in Revelation 20, verse 8. Here's the third fall when Satan is tossed into the lake of fire, Isaiah 14, 15, Ezekiel 28, 18 through 19. Now, I'm sorry I, had, I went through that fast, but I'm already a little probably past what our normal time. But I wanted to get that to you. Next time, we'll go through these verses, and then you're going to see something about Crater and Corvus. I'm, I'm sure that you, you aren't too familiar with Crater and Corvus. I wouldn't believe. But they are major players. Major players. In fact... That is in the last, these are the last two constellations in God's um, message in the stars. So I can't wait to show you those. We'll go to these verses next time. Now I'd like everyone please to bow your heads, close your eyes. Because there may be someone here who is inspired that God indeed is a very powerful and almighty God. They may be wondering or worried about their eternal destiny but there's nothing to be worried about the good news is that jesus christ is the son of god and he went to the cross to die for your sins the sins of the entire world and he died on that cross he was buried and then rose from the grave and now he offers to anyone who will trust him and him alone for eternal salvation eternal life it's a gift it's free you can have it right now by simply in your own mind or if you're live streaming saying or even thinking that i'm i'm believing that jesus christ is the line of judah i want to be on his team i don't want to go to the lake of fire i'm accepting jesus christ and in that moment you're born again you become a royal family member and your ticket to heaven is guaranteed now, Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for this study that we've done. Help us to have proper appreciation. Help us to think about these things, meditate on them, because when we do, it just seems like our, 
problems aren't so big anymore. So we pray that you will help us to focus on these and look for opportunities to tell people, anybody that we see about the great line of Judah that is on his way. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.